So, hello everyone. I am Vagis Misra. On behalf of our uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, I welcome everyone to today's talk. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Manuela Temer, who will be discussing space weather research and modeling. She is currently an associate professor for the last six years at the University of Grage, Austria. She earned her PhD from the University of Grage and has worked as a postdoc at Havar Observatory, Croatia, and subsequently as a senior research fellow at the Lockheed Martin Solar Astrophysics Laboratory, LMSL, in the USA. Professor Temer has several awards and honors to her credits as the NASA Group Achievement Award and Stanford University Distinguished Visiting Austrian Chair Professorship. She has led several projects at PI, served as a SOC member of several international conferences, and is one of the editorial board member of a reputed solar physics journal. She has more than 200 publications in reputed journals in the area of solar and heliospheric physics with uh, around uh, 8,000 citations. Following the talk of around uh, 45 to 50 minutes, we will have a short question and answer session. So please join me in welcoming Manuela Temer. Now I hand over the stage to Professor Temer and request her to begin her talk. Please, Temer. Thank you, Bagish, for the nice uh, introduction. And I'm really happy to, uh, to give the talk to you today also. Uh, to support your celebration. Um, so that's really a nice opportunity for me. Um, yeah. So um, as uh, Vagesh already introduced, I will um, talk today about space weather research and modeling uh, my expertise that I've worked on in the past um, yeah, 15 years, I would say. So just um, to start with, um, space weather is actually uh, physics on solar terrestrial relation. So uh, we have um, basically a combination of um, solar physics research, heliospheric physics research, and also geospace uh, research that covers uh, also the atmospheric levels of the Earth. So here we already talk about magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, and even the surface of the Earth, all are affected by solar activity. So that means whenever the sun is more or less active, the Earth uh, atmosphere as well as interplanetary space will react. In that respect, we have, um, uh, we have two components that are most important when talking about space weather research and also modeling. So that's on the one hand, the backbone of, uh, of, the, um, of the flow or interplanetary space, that's the solar wind. So the permanent outflow of, um, of wind from the sun or plasma and magnetic field from the sun, as well as transient events, um, coronal mass ejections will can, uh, that can disrupt the flow, the permanent flow quite strongly. So that means uh, the interplay between uh, these structures, so solar wind basically open, open structure and coronamagnetic, um, uh, so coronal mass ejections, magnetic fields that are closed, flux ropes, and shocks that are propagating in that flow, both can really act on the Earth's um, atmosphere and cause space weather effects in terms of satellite uh, disruptions, but also, as said, down to the surface, inducing uh, GIs, so that means uh, geomagnetically induced currents. So those are all things that um, in a modern society we are concerned of and um, that we need to better understand in order to improve models. Um, for better understanding, we have um, a lot of data sources and the data sources basically consist of um, remote sensing image data. So as you can see here, in the image, uh, we have a combination here of um, white light data from the well-known SOHO, um, SOHO spacecraft, um, um, the coronagraph image data, and some new data since, uh, since stereo uh, heliospheric image data that give us the opportunity to observe interplanetary space, even with image data over a wide range, namely covering the sun to earth and even beyond. From the in situ perspective, uh, we have a lot of uh, spacecraft um, either orbiting a planet, so like um, New Pepe Colombo or the past messenger around Mercury. We have uh, VEX uh, past uh, mission uh, around Venus, 
also around Earth and at L1, of course, uh, a lot of um, in situ spacecraft and even out at Mars, um, MAVEN is orbiting uh, the planet and gives us in situ um, measurements of the plasma and magnetic field. So we have remote data for observations as well as in situ plasma and magnetic field measurements. In combination, this gives us a very powerful tool. However, the drawback is while we have uh, large scale observations uh, from the image data, the in situ observations always give us only the localized view on the plasma and magnetic field behavior. And uh, with that, uh, we need to deal with a lot of uncertainties that is also affecting the models. Um, in a new way, Parker Solar Probe since 2018 and Solar Orbiter since uh, 2020 is um, is going in various orbits and even very close to the sun up to 10 solar radii um, and gives us as well image data but also in situ data and with the varying or dynamic orbit um, and uh, especially the off ecliptic orbit of solar orbiter that uh, will be reached in the coming years we will have uh, new opportunities and new image data especially from the magnetic field of the sun that will help to improve models but coming back to what we are actually observing from the sun, as um, I said, the activity of the sun. So we have um, flares and coronal mass ejections as the most um, energetic phenomena and the most uh, um, the most well known uh, space weather uh, components. So the um, the CMEs they usually arise from some complex and closed magnetic field structures that is suddenly erupting due to some instability. So usually uh, these flux ropes, they lie on the, so are kind of uh, held by the magnetic field in the lower coronal part, the lower coronal atmosphere. And uh, if there is some instability, this equilibrium that holds the, the stable filament or mass or plasma and magnetic field is then suddenly disrupted. So with, um, with the addition of magnetic uh, reconnection um, that adds a magnetic poloidal flux to that flux rope, the magnetic pressure inside that flux rope increases <clears throat> and causes the flux rope to expand and to erupt finally. So that means uh, the CMEs, uh, they usually erupt uh, very low in the corona and are strongly driven by the magnetic reconnection, by the magnetic flux that is added to the flux rope. There are also so-called stealth semis. They are much less driven. They usually go just with a solar wind outflow and they start to erupt higher up in the corona. Um, they are kind of um, simple field reconfigurations as said. But however, focusing on these very strongly driven semis, they are quite fast. They are wide, they are fast. And with that, they cause shocks and build up sheath regions in interplanetary space. So here is a typical view of, um, of a CME. So uh, that is, um, so here's the shock sheath part. We have here uh, the void uh, that is caused by the magnetic uh, flux rope. So that means we have a much higher magnetic pressure and less uh, plasma inside. Um, so that uh, causes this typical void. And we have the core that is usually assumed to be uh, plasma. All these, um, these strong <clears throat> field line or the strong CMEs, they are driven by flares, uh, so the plasma emissions. On the other hand, if we don't have erupting um, uh, flux ropes or eruptive uh, flares, we have also so-called confined events. And uh, confined events, they are rare, but they exist. Um, they might have very strong um, flare emission or X-ray and EUV emission, but they don't cause any mass ejection. Also, that is of relevance for space weather, since if we observe a strong flare, we usually are alerted uh, for space weather events. But if there are confined events that might cause false alarms. So knowing whether the active region is eruptive or not is also one of the key things of future research. Here in the movie, um, I guess to all of you very well known is the 2000 three era or the phase solar activity phase the last really strong activity phase we had from the sun 
So here we see the coronal mass ejections um, that leave the sun abruptly. Here we have already um, the particles, uh, so solar energetic particles that hit the camera of, uh, of Soho Lasco, and uh, they have speeds of a few hundred up to 3000 kilometers per second. The disturbances, they travel only in a few uh, days, uh, so even less than a day, uh, the Sun-Earth distance range. So that means whenever we observe a flare and the CME in the coronagraph, uh, we have um, a reaction time to give alarms um, of about 24 to 48 hours. So that means uh, we need to know very well about um, the specific characteristics of a coronal mass ejection, how wide it is, how fast it is, and what type of magnetic field it has. Does it have um, the typical south orientation of the magnetic field, so the BZ component to the south that um, might cause the most strong space weather effects, or does it have a very strong uh, driven uh, shock component and sheath components that also causes space weather variations. So all that uh, needs to be analyzed within a few hours only, and also models need to be run within only a few hours. The difficulty we have is um, the observations of CMEs. What we have um, actually seen here in the movie is, um, is in principle a projection effect of the um, of the white light uh, image data. So that means uh, we look through the uh, plasma and magnetic field. The CMEs are typically optical thin. They have, um, they have uh, um, an extended uh, shock component, so a three-dimensional shock component that is then only seen as a two-dimensional uh, kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, yeah, this um, bubble-like uh, two component uh, part, but we do not actually know about this uh, three dimensional extension here. And what we basically observe is the shock region, so the compressed uh, plasma region um, here and not the um, and not the, the driver. So this is the component, uh, the driver component, the magnetic flux rope that actually holds the magnetic uh, field, uh, so the magnetic field that might cause the intense storms if a negative PZ is, um, is present. So that means this uh, magnetic flux rope is usually less well observed for CMEs that propagate towards us. So that means this halo CMEs that we observed in the, uh, excuse me, that we observed in the movie here is, is not well, um, is not well uh, presented. And that means uh, using such models, uh, so that is a typical three-dimensional reconstruction model, a so-called uh, graduated cylindrical shell model, GCS, is then used uh, to get the three-dimensional uh, perspective. But we can only do that if we have additional spacecraft that look at uh, the CME uh, or observe the CME from a side view. So if we only have uh, the pro uh, projected view, then it's um, simply impossible to do the 3D reconstruction. So that means uh, stereoscopic uh, observations are very important to better understand the three-dimensionality of CMEs and also about their propagation behavior in interplanetary space. So if we look here at the further type of models with uh, multi-spacecraft data, so these, um, uh, these models, as already said, um, we have the GCS model here, and the thing is we need to distinguish between the shock and the driver part. Here in the um, in the figure here that is uh, taken from um, um, a paper from uh, myself and Naria Kinita in 2015, uh, we see from the halo perspective only by knowing uh, the side perspective that uh, with the yellow here um, we mark the flux rope component, so the magnetic part of the coronal mass ejection, while the green part is the shock component. In that respect, um, the um, the a uh, halo perspective is giving us a very low information. And as already said, only if we have multi-spacecraft data, we will be able to fully get these, uh, the 3D structure and also to get the deprojected speeds. Having only the halo components, uh, usually we underestimate speeds. And when feeding space weather models, um, having a, a lower speed than, uh, than the real speed is, we very much underestimate the propagation time. That means also the arrival time is usually then underestimated and CMEs might arrive earlier than expected. 
What else can we do in addition to have this very low information or very um, uncertain information? So we need to kind of uh, use complementary uh, data and complementary information to overcome the limitations here from the white lights data. And that basically means also to connect to surface parameters. So the question is what type of additional surface uh, signatures we observe at the sun in order to give a better constraint on the uh, CME components like speed, width, uh, the mass of the CME, all that influences the propagation behavior of the CME and all that influences the, um, the arrival time or the model feeds that we do. In the, um, in the upper panel here, we, we see the um, um, a schematic uh, profile of uh, CME um, uh, velocity, so speed in, in blue here, and the CME acceleration in red. And in addition, uh, we see from the flare, so from a surface um, observation in EUV, we see the soft X-ray flux in orange and in green, the hard X-ray flux. So that means uh, we have um, uh, we have additional information. We see the match between the soft um, X, uh, the hard X-ray flux in the flare and the acceleration phase of the CME, and we have a quite good match of the increase uh, in the speed profile um, between the soft X-ray flux of the flare and in blue here the velocity of the CME. So that means uh, getting additional information about different energetic uh, emission uh, from the flare of the that is associated to the CME, we, uh, we can get additional information about the CME itself. That is usually called the CME flare feedback uh, relation. So the hard X-ray flare and the CME acceleration is synchronized almost for very strong events. And also the soft X-ray flare emission and the CME speed is very well matching each other. So there are several um, papers that, uh, that did work on that. And in, um, uh, in the last, um, I'm sorry about that, in the last um, uh, few years, also the dimming regions were um, discovered to play a substantial role or give us complementary information about the CME mass and about the CME speed, actually. So that um, um, a mass is uh, depleted. Um, we call it coronal mass ejections, right? So there is mass depleted uh, from the surface. So that means uh, the bright EUV emission is, is falling off because plasma, hot plasma, is evaporated into the into the CME body. So that means we leave a dark footprint on the EUV surface, and that is uh, usually called as EUV dimming. That was discovered uh, by Hudson and Cliver also 20 already 20 years back. And uh, Christina Mandrini was working on more specifics and calling it core dimmings uh, that are kind of very closely related to the flare ribbons and also the secondary dimmings that is more outlining the CME body evolution. In recent years, uh, we also did here in Graz a lot of um, studies on the dimmings and could show that the core dimmings are actually related to the CME foot points. So that's actually the place or the location where the mass is evaporated into the body of the CME. And uh, also that the CME, in, uh, the dimming intensity, so how dark the dimming is, is very much related to the CME speed. So here we see from a um, study by Karin Dissauer that the maximum velocity that we observed in the CME is very nicely related uh, with a high correlation coefficient to the intensity, to the mean intensity of the associated dimming region. So these um, flares and also dimmings, so they give us um, complementary information and may uh, be used as a contribution to, first of all, detect CMEs. We were talking about um, we were talking about confined events, right? But also to give us um, uh, additional view on typical characteristics of a CME like a speed before it even enters uh, the coronagraph. Just here is an illustration. Uh, we have, um, um, I give you here the uh, kind of, um, yeah, a cartoon of um, what I was just explaining. So we have here the, the flux rope of the CME that is very much related to the core dimming regions. Also, the core dimming regions are usually uh, located in opposite uh, polarity magnetic fields, uh, so a clear relation to the magnetic flux rope. And uh, we have the secondary dimming here that is related uh, to the actual 
orientation of the CINI body. So that also means in which, um, uh, with respect to the core dimming region, how the secondary dimming region looks like. Is it asymmetric or is it very symmetric? We know in which um, is the CINI radially going outwards to the sun or is it a little bit inclined? So with that um, uh, relation between core and secondary dimming region gives us additional information. Also, the uh, sort of means direction of eruption um, and the coronal wave part that is very much related to the semi shock wave that is built up if we have a very strong event. Also, the shock wave that is related to the lateral expansion of the semi clearly shows us the inclination of the semi. Is it more inclined to the uh, to a certain direction? So with that, we can get, um, as already said, we can get um, information about the semi speed before it even enters uh, the chronograph uh, CME, uh, the chronograph field of view. We have the directivity of the CME before it even enters the chronograph CME uh, field of view. And also a shockwave gives us an estimate how strong the CME evolves. So that means it, it, uh, it already very early managed to build up, um, uh, to build up a shock. So, in addition to that, um, uh, we have from the flare side um, the reconnected flux. So, that's, um, that's basically really the flux, the magnetic flux that drives, that drives the CME. So, the fuel for the CME, the power of the CME comes from the reconnected flux. And with the reconnected flux, if we are able to, to get all the components of the reconnected flux, that also is used for, um, for newly developed models that actually use um, not only pressure pulse uh, for CME propagation, but also that use uh, the magnetic field as an information about the uh, strength of the of the CME. So how to come to total reconnected flux uh, that can be used as input uh, for CME propagation models. So usually all um, type of reconnection, every magnetic structure that is um, showing a reorientation uh, and instability might add to the uh, reconnected flux. Uh, we might think of uh, that reconnection is not strong enough to give us a signal in UV or soft X-ray, so that means it's not necessarily related to bright, um, uh, to bright um, uh, phenomena in UV or soft X-ray. Um, so filament, um, uh, the rising of the filament might already show us a start of reconnected uh, flux and uh, that is already very early on observed before the CME even starts to erupt. Um, when the reconnection is then fully setting in, um, we get clear signatures of EUV, soft X-ray, H-alpha flare ribbon areas and brightness um, and motions of these ribbons. And in addition to that, um, on the same timeline, we already observed the core dimmings next to the ribbon evolution. As already said, the flux rope is uh, assumed to be rooted in these core dimmings. So that means whatever is um, is kind of um, uh, so uh, the plasma that is uh, evaporated into the flux rope is coming out of the uh, out of these core regions and um, that's core dimming regions, and that's usually very closely related to the uh, to the uh, semi. Um, eruption site and the flare ribbons. And in addition, after we um, we have um, a weakening of the UV and soft X-ray signatures, I'm really sorry, I have some temporal, some automatized uh, switching of the slides here. That's why I need to jump a little bit back. So the secondary dimmings are usually also observed much later on in comparison to the flare ribbons, because um, as already said, we might not have enough energy, so energetic particles might not be strong enough to cause signals in our remote sensing image data. So all in all, um, together also with the post-eruptive arcades, um, with the areas here, we have a very long time range where reconnected flux might be fed into the flux rope. What we usually use is the flare and the full CME eruption, but in addition, there might be um, a longer time where flux uh, is added. So that means also we have large uncertainties in deriving these reconnected flux and the values that are revealed, they usually um, also depending on the method that is used, um, they already span a large uh, uncertainty of about plus minus 50%. There are also empirical relations uh, that can be used, especially the PEA areas, so the post-eruptive arcade areas, they are very much giving us a quite good estimate of the 
um, of the um, reconnected flux um, that was uh, shown in a in a recent study by by Gopal Swami and collaborators. In total, we have now um, a lot of signatures that we can use for CME observations on these dimmings waves. So the corner wave we see here, the corner of the flank of the CME in the corona as it compresses the plasma. We have the flare region in the coronagraph field of view. Later on, we see the body, we see the shock wave, and we see also energetic particles. So all in all, um, a very well studied event in the um, in 2017, in September, this was um, uh, from the space weather perspective the most well observed, the most well studied event. Um, and I can recommend, uh, if you would like to go into detail, about uh, getting also the chain of uh, reaction um, about space weather events. Uh, uh, you can go through all the uh, components in a, in a, in a great detail and learn about um, the consequences that each of the component has on space weather. But um, as you can see here, um, with the observations that we have up to date, um, um, we have a very strong uh, complementary view on, on these corner mass ejections. And this uh, complementary view, uh, just give you here um, kind of a summary slides, um, uh, together with the surface uh, phenomena that are related to an eruptive event, we can have a very early estimate of how strong a CME might be how fast it might travel from sun to earth and uh, what type of um, uh, what type of effects it might have the only thing that is still missing is of course the bz components the orientation but that is um, that is a very different story so here in a summary uh, we see that um, from the flare perspective um, h alpha eov soft x ray hard x ray even white light emission give us um, information about the strength of the event the mass release uh, observed in the dimming regions, um, but also observed in the reorientation of the field um, in radio bursts, um, gives us um, information about the um, about the CME body itself and how fast it might be. The flux rope formation is, in addition to filament eruption, an information point that is uh, very important because uh, the flux rope formation is um, is also not uh, easy to to derive uh, if there is no filament uh, present. Then we have propagating surface waves uh, that uh, are related then to the laterally expanding shock. So when we go towards the, the next um, step about the CME mass, um, the CME sheath region uh, is, is something that is um, uh, just became um, in, the, in the recent years, um, um, especially with the review by Emilia Kilper, very, uh, so she uh, pointed out the importance of the sheath uh, region, because the sheath region is uh, the accumulation of mass. So even if we know from the surface of the sun about um, the estimate about how much mass is erupting, uh, there is additional mass accumulated um, by the CME in the front. And with the additional accumulation of mass, the CME might uh, slow down, but it, on the other hand, might also gain more momentum as it goes. So in the recent studies, um, it could be shown that the um, that the mass increase um, in the um, in the observations in the chronograph observation is not related to the sheath buildup. The sheath buildup um, builds up much later on, most probably uh, somewhere beyond um, uh, the twenty solar radii, but uh, definitely beyond uh, ten solar radii. Uh, we also did a recent study using Helios data that uh, earliest. Uh, the sheath buildup might start at about 13 uh, solar radii, and we're very much looking forward to Parker solar probe data in order to um, kind of um, uh, support the, uh, these, um, these, uh, these results here. So the, uh, the sheath formation and the accumulation of mass, as already said, a very important point uh, because this is all related to the drag force. So the uh, propagation behavior of CME is related to the aerodynamic or the um, uh, proxy of the aerodynamic uh, drag force for the magnetohydrodynamic drag, uh, drag force. And that is uh, related to the, uh, to the density and also the volume. Uh, so that means the size of the CME and the mass of the CME is decisive. So the smaller the CME and the more massive, the less drag it will experience and vice versa. So if we have very large but low mass CMEs, 
they experience a lot of drag. And that means the travel time will increase and uh, in space weather uh, warnings uh, will have, um, um, so we have uh, more time to react on space weather events. While if we have uh, kind of medium sized uh, CMEs with a very um, large mass, uh, they might propagate um, uh, much, much um, faster through interplanetary space. So in addition to the um, characteristics of the CME, also the characteristics, of course, of the ambient solar wind is very important. That's why I already mentioned the solar wind, the backbone of, um, of interplanetary space, the backbone of space weather models. So the solar wind, um, the plasma and the magnetic field behavior in the interplanetary space is something of real importance. And um, if we don't, um, if we're not able to model the background solar wind um, completely and uh, and correctly, uh, the CME propagation is not uh, correctly um, reflected. So that means uh, space weather models uh, might fail. And especially if we have uh, increased um, activity, um, the, the background solar wind is usually more turbulent, uh, has uh, a lot of large scale structures. Um, we think here of um, uh, especially then um, uh, kind of uh, other CMEs that might um, that might uh, be in the way and that uh, can cause then um, a lot of different effects on CME propagation. So the, uh, the CME is um, tending to adjust to the ambient solar wind. So that uh, means it might rotate that also has effects on the VZ component. It uh, adjusts to the magnetic field, uh, so there is um, a channeling, so that means also the propagation direction might change due to the adjustment uh, of the CME to the ambient solar wind. Um, the um, location of coronal holes, as we know, um, coronal holes are the sources of fast solar wind. As the fast solar wind is emanating from these holes, it structures interplanetary space. And if CMEs then uh, kind of uh, impinge on these uh, high speed streams, they also, um, they also usually undergo some, uh, some deflection. So that also means they change uh, their propagation direction. Um, the shocks might be less effective as, um, as a shock is not easily built up in a very fast ambient flow. And there are a lot of effects. So to fully understand the CME propagation behavior in interplanetary space, and as we see here, we have a lot of fine structures in the solar wind. Um, so if we would like to fully understand and be able to fully model semi propagation, we need to know the spatial distribution of solar wind parameters. So with that, uh, corner holes are of importance as sources of fast solar wind. Uh, we also see the mixture of open and closed magnetic field that is rooted uh, so the open field is rooted in the in the corona holes and the ambient closed field is interacting with this open field. So the interacting structures, uh, CRs and SIRs, um, they, are of, um, they are of importance because they also pose a type of a boundary uh, for the CME. Um, so in that respect, um, studying CMEs always means also studying um, the background solar wind and with that corona holes. Um, so we, we also know in the past um, years that uh, we have in this open flux or the, um, the high speed streams and uh, open fields where it is actually generated is, has a lot of uncertainties. If we compare the observations to models, we have uncertainties of more than 25%. Uh, Parker Pro, uh, Solar Probe showed us about switchbacks. So that means we have a, a direction, sudden change in direction, um, a bit out of the sun, so not at the sun, but a bit out of the sun that also causes uh, changes in this background solar wind uh, flow. And uh, with that, the, um, the model validation, so to be able to model these open flux correctly is a, a very important, um, uh, is a very important component uh, to better or to improve um, um, background solar wind models. And also these ISWAP initiatives, so international initiatives are very helpful um, community effort in doing so. So just to give you a little bit more um, insight on the fine structure, so where actually open field emanates. So we see here the fine structure of corner holes. It's not that the entire corner hole structure here is open field. So we see here only by this um, uh, by this um, um, uh, bluish um, uh, type of uh, um, of um, so blue red uh, pepper type um, uh, magnetic fields. So these are showing us uh, the opposite polarities, 
And uh, with the strong field here um, in this positive polarity showing in, uh, in red, we see that uh, they are predominantly open. So that means it's not the entire area that is open. There are very specific and localized fields uh, that are open to interplanetary space. So that means only, um, um, so there are, is um, uh, of this unbalanced so open, uh, open flux is um, arising. So 38% uh, of this unbalanced flux is arising from only 1% of the uh, coronal hole area when taking into account only very strong fields. So that means half of the open flux is only coming from 1% inside these coronal hole. So the question is um, how these um, structures, how can these small flux tubes that are emanating uh, from these coronal hole structure the entire interplanetary space, or do we miss some open flux somewhere? So this is also a current um, uh, research. Not only coronal holes, uh, but also the um, uh, also um, CMEs that are propagating in interplanetary space, uh, they pose uh, obstacles or boundaries. And with that, uh, we have um, uh, there were many many studies, uh, including a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, by Vagesh and his team on CME CME interaction events. So the obstacles um, that are posed here are even more strong in comparison to um, two solar wind structures. So we have um, if two flux ropes interacting, so that means the second um, CME should be faster in comparison to the first CME. And also uh, having different masses, we are facing different types of, um, um, of um, interaction. So there might be elastic, inelastic, super elastic um, interactions, also changing propagation direction, changing the maybe kinematics of the CME. What we basically um, know is also that the CME, the first CME that is kind of squeezed um, or is hindered uh, in its expansion from the back, is kind of keeping its uh, magnetic field in a very strong way. Um, uh, so that means also the, um, um, pr uh, the, the space weather effects are much more strong if we have um, a CME that is blocked by ex um, in its expansion. Also, if the two um, flux ropes come together, magnetic reconnection might be uh, going on. Um, and we also know that if the shock of the second CME propagates through the first CME, we have a lot more turbulence. And uh, with that, all the space weather effects, the fluctuations and negative DZ components become more intense. And most intense geomagnetic storms are the cause of these interacting events. And uh, with that, um, CME interaction is a, is also a very a very important um, a very important um, uh, field of of research. With the um, the interaction, um, also we see that um, models need to be adjusted to this. We have um, a, a lot of uh, so we see here from the uh, Euphoria model uh, several CMEs that are propagating here. We see how they interact, start to interact here, the flanks. We see how they disrupt um, uh, the usual type of Parker spiral, solar wind, and all that needs to be taken into account as CMEs are very frequent phenomena. We have uh, two to three CMEs per day um, in the solar minimum, but four uh, to five uh, during maximum, um, two to three per week, sorry, and four to five per day during the maximum. So that means uh, with the travel time, we may estimate Two, 2 to 20 CMEs um, within the Sun-Earth sector, depending on the solar cycle phase. And with that, um, the interaction and preconditioning of the interplanetary space is more the rule and not the exception. And we also see that um, as soon as we have several CMEs um, ongoing in interplanetary space, the model performance is drastically decreasing. So models are not reliable anymore. The background solar wind flow is not reliable anymore. And also the CME propagation behavior itself is very much, um, uh, so is, is not uh, modeled and simulated uh, well. Um, so Euphoria is, um, is also adding a magnetic flux that should uh, kind of um, overcome the drawbacks um, and should be the new generation um, of flux ropes models. Um, here we see also that uh, we are not only like in the, so not only pressure pulse, 
um, like we see it here, um, is giving um, or gives us a simulation of CME propagation. But here, in a more sophisticated way, the magnetic field and the flow is kind of um, is kind of propagating, and that should give us more detail about the um, about the the CME and about the magnetic field, especially. However, these are again for isolated CMEs. If we would like to model several CMEs, that is um, uh, that is in computational effort. That is a uh, very uh, very strong and very high, and uh, and with that also a lot of um, a lot of complication uh, comes in. In another approach, um, instead of numerical models, also analytical models help us in improving our understanding. And especially with the um, several perspectives that we have here, um, so studies from stereo, uh, the model um, is giving us, um, as already said, the projection effects are giving us a lot of uncertainties. And also in the analytical models, we see how the fronts might be um, measured differently or modeled differently, depending from which perspective we feed our models. So that means um, the projection effects, the uncertainties, that we have are a very um, are a big issue, and um, and this needs to be studied in a more um, in a more sophisticated way. So the models here are type of all um, uh, type of all um, um, coming into the um, into the um, undisturbed background solar wind, and um, and with the preconditioning again uh, we increase the complexity. And um, and with that, um, the um, interplanetary space. Um, before using those models, um, we need to um, insert um, a few days of um, uh, of disturbances, so transient events that are observed a few days before the actual event uh, that we would like to analyze. Um, we need to add uh, all the disturbances um, a few days before to be able to use those type of um, those type of models. And um, the preconditioning, as already said, um, not, not only CMEs, but also um, high speed streams that propagate through interplanetary space, they all act on the drag. So they might alter the drag, they might change the magnetic field. Um, and with that, um, we need to better um, understand these um, impacts, um, the interaction events. We need to better understand um, um, CMEs that leave the sun at least two to five days and how they interact and how they um, shape the interplanetary space, how they change interplanetary space a few days before in order to be able to make um, uh, assumptions and estimates about um, uh, the event of interest. If the scene is then finally, so as a last uh, step, is, um, is kind of propagating through and uh, impacting at Earth, we have a cascade of reactions. As already said, uh, we even have uh, GICs, so that means induced currents at the surface of the Earth. But the reactions include um, magnetospheric um, disturbances. Um, they include ionospheric uh, disturbances. Even satellites, um, they can um, uh, they can um, uh, get um, increase the drag and and might be um, and might be um, hindered by in its orbit. Um, I guess you all heard about the Starlink event um, in um, in mid of um, February, so where 40 satellites uh, from the uh, SpaceX mission or Starlink um, network uh, were kind of um, destroyed. Uh, they uh, they lost their orbit. Uh, they were quite low in the in the um, atmosphere of the Earth and uh, maybe uh, caused uh, so the, the uh, space weather event that was related to that caused um, maybe an increased drag. That then um, that then uh, caused the orbit loss of these Starlink events. So as we see, this is a very actual um, um, kind of um, um, effect, and uh, that we can uh, that we can study and that we learn a lot of. We also know that um, um, especially for the thermospheric um, level, the differences in the response of magnetosphere and thermosphere um, are quite. Um, uh, varying. So we have um, the sheath, as already said, is a very important component. It has a different response. It uh, reacts more on the um, higher latitude levels of the Earth in comparison to uh, the flux rope that reacts more on the mid latitude um, atmospheric uh, mid latitude locations of the Earth. So also differencing between a sheath and um, a flux rope is is an um, is an important point here. 
Uh, we also need to make differences between a CME and a CR driven storm and most important about the combination of these and the um, and uh, the forecasting of all this um, of all this is um, is an issue as already said we have a lot of uh, uncertainties in our models but um, in addition uh, to that uh, the uh, flux EUV flux that comes from the flare is also giving us additional preconditioning, not in the in not in interplanetary space this time, but a preconditioning of the magnetospheric, ionospheric, and thermospheric level. So also those are quite new studies that are um, that are ongoing to better understand about the impact of CMEs and CRs at Earth. And in that respect, um, also in my group, uh, my PhD Florian Koller is um, is actually. Uh, studying the uh, the uh, the coupling between the solar wind and the the Earth uh, magnetosphere in terms of magneto sheath jets that are occurring, they are a significant coupling effect, and we see that as soon as a CR or a CME is is kind of impacting at the um, at the magneto sheath here. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reactions ongoing, and these um, these jets that they might propagate even further down to the magnetopause, and then might even cause then further reactions. So we also need to um, better understand how the um, the impact of the CRs uh, and CMEs, and in combination, um, interacting events, especially how they impact uh, the magneto sheath, and further on, um, give reactions um, then down to the to the surface. So the effects on planetary atmospheres of um, of these um, solar activity phenomena that we are um, dealing with uh, since uh, several decades are, are still not well understood, and there are more and more missions that are actually helping us in improve our understanding uh, because of more and more valuable data. And with that, um, the advantage of multi spacecraft views, multi multiple viewpoints, I would like to point out again, um, L5, um, uh, L5 mission, the upcoming ESA L5 mission, as it is called Vigil at the moment, um, is, um, is, um, is uh, an important uh, mission that will give us a permanent um, uh, side view and to overcome the projection effects and with that giving us uh, continuous monitoring of um, of Earth uh, uh, Sun Earth directed events, so with the side views as already explained, uh, it's also better um, uh, distinguishable between the shock sheath and the magnetic uh, structure, and um, and in addition having the in situ data at L1 so an L5 uh, L1 combination with the in situ measurements, uh, we will have uh, we will have then a complete uh, or more complete view on the on the events. Um, so with that, also multi-spacecraft data like uh, from VEX, Messenger, Maven, BSB, Solar Orbiter, all that helps us in improving our understanding of the propagation of, of, the, um, of the structures or activity phenomena from the sun. So um, in summary as, um, and also in, in conclusion, so I hope that I could show you additional um, important uh, observations of CME properties, uh, properties and characteristics before they even enter a coronagraph field of view, namely um, low coronal uh, source region characteristics, and also uh, that we permanently or better um, kind of um, um, need to understand the reconnection process and the linking to the um, flare emission filament eruptions, dimmings, um, and uh, CMEs in the end. Also, the um, ambient magnetic field uh, configuration, like um, when is an active region giving rise to a CME, and when is it uh, confined, um, and how about the propagation behavior if it's an eruptive event. Um, um, the magnetic pressure gradients in there are very important parameters. So the propagation um, itself is then influenced by the structures that are also rooted, of course, on the uh, surface of the sun, so corner holes, open field, the interplay between open and closed flux, a very important uh, component of space weather uh, research, 
and uh, last but not least, the interaction events and preconditioning uh, to get the extreme uh, space weather effects. Um, they need to better be better modeled and better simulated. But before that, we need to have an improved uh, understanding of the physics, um, what's what's going on, but which is usually hard as we do not have um, a lot of in situ measurements uh, from those interaction or, or at least at the interaction side. So all in all, um, we still face a challenge of correctly feeding inputs uh, or correct, correctly feeding models so with the input parameters. Uh, we need to assess the uncertainties of all the parameters that are fed into the model. And with that, um, uh, that is usually the expertise that I, uh, so the, the fields and topics that, uh, that I um, hopefully um, uh, kind of could show you. Is um, is not uh, is usually not covered by one uh, person or one team or one institute. So that means we need international teams, and that's an um, international team effort to work together to better understand the entire uh, picture of uh, space weather. And space weather research is is an interdisciplinary uh, platform that brings us all together. And um, this is where uh, interdisciplinary research meets. And uh, I would like to advertise here. Um, also, Wagesh is um, thankfully a team member here. The ISWOT initiatives, are international space weather action teams that are working on different topics and all together, we hopefully will understand in the future a little bit better about um, the sources of activity on the sun up to the geospace, how the sun, the solar activity impacts geospace and maybe on a long term also um, explains um, uh, explains a little bit more about the atmospheric um, evolution. And with that, we can also bridge to to stellar colleagues uh, for exoplanets. And with that, I would like to thank you for the um, thank you for listening. And um, yeah, I'm open for questions. Thanks a lot. So uh, thank you, Manuela, for this uh, very nice, very interesting talk. And I'm sure that uh, my colleagues will have some questions. And I request them to raise their hands using the WebEx feature and then sequentially ask their questions. I can identify if they raise their hands. So let me just see. Yeah, so Jayan, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, so uh, in one of the slides, you show the hard X-ray and the soft X-ray evolution with the CME acceleration. So how actually, so means uh, this is statistically is this well proven that these are always connected for the CMEs? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's in principle, it's only for strong CMEs, uh, uh, statistically valid. Um, there, um, if we have um, um, kind of X-ray, X-ray flares and uh, and strong CMEs, uh, this is a very synchronized behavior, and we can really uh, make um, almost one-to-one -one match here. However, the weaker the flare is, um, the less well this uh, correlation holds. So there is um, there is uh, surely some yeah for strong events. This is uh, statistically. Valid, but um, if we go to less energetic events, uh, there are obviously additional components. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see Bhargav had a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, Manuela. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very, very nice talk. Uh, I just had a question uh, regarding the modeling of CMEs, especially their arrival times. Uh, uh, there are several of these codes like Enlil or Euphoria that do not actually get the arrival times very accurately. And you discussed in your talk about the mass of the sheet region as well. Mm -hmm. Have you estimated or uh, does uh, the modeling people have estimated the role of thermal conduction uh, as far as the CME uh, propagation is concerned and whether that affects the sheet mass and the sheet thickness, thereby affecting the drag force on the CME? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that thermal conduction, I'm, I know it from Magish also, it's uh, pretty new and um, this is usually not uh, well covered. Uh, and uh, this is especially in the models. Uh, the models uh, might not even cover well a mass increase as far as I know. Um, so um, especially these models, um, uh, as you see here, they are pure pressure pulse. So that means they don't even have any magnetic field in. And with that, um, uh, and with that, um, uh, don't really cover um, all the physics. 
Um, with the uh, with the new spheromark model, you have the magnetic field in, but um, I'm not sure how well it it covers um, mass gain or or um, or um, thermodynamic behavior here. So that um, uh, I think um, yeah, that might be something of a, a future development uh, step. Uh, but also from the I guess observational side, some more convincing um, uh, results might be needed uh, before implement or being able to implement that into models. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. Yeah, please, Sudhir, go ahead with your question. Yes, Sudhir, please go ahead. I think uh, we are unable to listen. You. you can put the question in chat box. I think that would be also fine. Yeah, I think uh, Sudhir, we cannot listen. Sudhir, okay. Next question I can take from Rajguru, please. Uh, hi, hi. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Thanks. I'm sorry. So I, I you were uh, when you were discussing about the coronal holes and the uh, CME propagation. You mentioned about switchbacks. I'm just wondering. Sorry for a very naive question. So I'm just wondering: Are there already studies which uh, which relate the impact of switchbacks on the CME propagation? Um, I'm not aware of. Okay. Um, I mean, there are uh, there are several uh, CMEs that were already observed with uh, Parker Solar Probe. Uh, so there. Um, so I mean, uh, the list is is growing. But I mean, the switchbacks are, are rather close. I'm not sure if there was a switchback and CME observation um, or a CME that kind of uh, propagates okay. within switchback. Um, I'm not aware of, but uh, if okay. there would be, so please send me the, the archive payment. <laughs> okay. I was just curious. I have one more uh, question since you meant, uh, you talked about the L5 advantages, and uh, we now know that uh, ESA has announced the uh, the L5 mission vigil. vigil. I'm just wondering what kind of, uh, uh, I mean, are there, um, you know, instruments which will address some of you, what you have discussed here? I mean, um, you... Yeah, sure. I, I mean, there, there will be, um, there will be white lights, um, like heliospheric images. There will be EUV, um, mm -hmm. image data, um, available. And, uh, as far far as I know, there will be also magnetic fields um, information, so magnetograph that will show us a little bit more from the east uh, side uh, of the sun. And, and with that, uh, that might uh, be used as additional modeling input mm -hmm. because up to now we, we only have uh, the Earth view, right? And, and with that, we need to use some um, uh, kind of um, synoptic data to get the, the entire rotation. And, um, um, and with uh, Virgil, uh, Vigil, we would have uh, additional maybe input from that. So um, definitely EUV surface uh, structures will be observed, um, um, coronagraph plus also heliospheric images to follow the CME from sun to earth uh, will be uh, will be the most important instruments on that, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. thank you. Yeah, so Manuela, one question is in chat box by Sudhir and he asked that uh, during interaction, the reconnection may also happen. So how this can affect the kinematics of CME and how one can identify such a reconnection in the interpretary space? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, um, the kinematics, not sure actually how it uh, might affect. I mean, uh, we, we might uh, think of um, kind of uh, magnetic erosion, right? Um, if the CME is a type of peeled off uh, due to the uh, interaction, um, how these um, interplays with, uh, I mean, if we have um, a reconnection then between two, uh, two CMEs, uh, there are simulations by, by Noé Lugas on, on that. Um, I mean, how it affects the kinematics, uh, not sure, but it definitely will uh, lead to a change in the, in the magnetic pressure of the, of the flux rope and, um, um, and, um, and with that, uh, I guess, also add some, some turbulent part maybe. Um, to identify those in intermediary space is um, 
uh, we can only um, so there are some very rare observations in situ observations where the reconnection exhaust is uh, is observed. So that means you have very strong spikes between two flux ropes. Uh, so um, uh, or not spikes, but uh, very strong changes in in temperature density, magnetic field that is sitting um, in between uh, two flux rope um, uh, in situ measurements. Um, also, the uh, so that's one of the uh, most um, uh, intriguing uh, measurements to to see whether reconnection might have happened. Uh, but um, otherwise, I'm I'm not sure if you so looking at uh, remote sensing data. I'm I'm not sure how to identify that. I'm, I'm I think there is no possibility to identify. So it needs um, to be measured by by in situ data, and with that also. Um, the spacecraft needs to go through this uh, reconnection site or close to the reconnection sites. Yeah, so others, you have a question, please ask. Yes, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, when you mentioned about uh, in a slide that when we are measuring or analyzing a CME, we should take care of the CMEs that have passed through the IP space some four or five years before that. So, mm -hmm. is it just an estimate of four or five years? Uh, sorry, four or five hours. So, is, is it just an estimate or like? Um, the yeah. So the um in uh, my paper in twenty seventeen, we were looking at um, at CMEs. So basically isolated. I mean isolated as far as we could uh, isolate them or or get an um, uh, extract uh, the isolated CMEs from uh, from catalogs, and we could show that. Uh, um, when a CME, on a statistical sense, when a CME goes through interplanetary space and is measured by ACE or wind or so, um, the solar wind speed is still enhanced at least two, but up to five days um, past. So when the, the CME ends, so after the magnetic flux rope is through, the solar wind speed is still enhanced and goes back to the kind of uh, pre CME level only two to five days afterwards. So from that we um, concluded that um, the this interplanetary space needs to relax or has a relaxed time. Um, this is also kind of um, comparable to the <clears throat> sorry uh, to the uh, quiet solar wind uh, flow speed. So we also need to think of if a CME erupts from the sun, um, we have the dimming region. So that means a lot of mass is going out. Um, the flow. Um, um, it disrupts um, uh, closed field lines nearby. So that means the usual flow that is permanently going off the sun is disrupted at this moment. And if we take um, 400, 500 kilometers per second uh, quiet solar wind flow, um, it also needs four to five days to propagate from sun to earth. So that would also mean that um, that the, the refill of the uh, disrupted interplanetary space um, uh, so that um, the quiet uh, wind is be, is able to to fill again uh, interplanetary space. It, that's also in a similar timeline. So uh, with that uh, two to five days, I think is it's not a surprising um, time range. So it also does depend on the size or the mass of the CME. Um, that's usually yeah. Uh, I mean, the more massive, the more the, the more wide and and big the CME is. Of course, uh, it's. Um, Expected to have more uh, kind of impact on um, disturbing uh, disturbing interplanetary space. Yes, but um, I'm not sure how. You know, I wouldn't say now that uh, it's small CMEs. Uh, it's two days, and a big CME it's five days. So um, I wouldn't really go for that. But um, that's just an average value. But I would would expect that larger CMEs might have a little bit more um, impact on that. So okay, I had another question. Uh at the end, uh, you mentioned something about exoplanets. So, studying the sun being so near, we can have um, we can study it with much greater detail. But is it really feasible for other planet, other sun, other stars? I mean, the thing is, um, um, the sun is our Rosetta stone, right? So, uh, Sun Earth system is the only system that we know really very well. And uh, we we only start now to uh, to better understand how the sun interacts with Earth, but we also have um, uh, spacecraft at, um, or we also have measurements from Mercury, from Venus, but Mars. So that means we can even get a little bit of a uh, distance uh, relation, 
and um, and with that uh, we see how um, how CMEs might impact at different distances um, or or stream interaction regions at different distances how they might interact with the with the atmosphere. For the Earth, we even know about um, I mean we have a chemical composition of the atmosphere and know uh, if a CME impacts how that um, uh, is uh, kind of disturbed what um, uh, cascades of reactions, chemical compositions, uh, etc., how that uh, uh, reacts on, on that impact. And um, at least um, for exoplanets, when kind of making an estimate that CMEs occur maybe more frequently, uh, which is not observed yet, right? Um, or if we estimate that the CMEs might be wider or um, or, or things like that, or the, the stellar wind might be faster, you can always do some estimation and get then maybe an, um, yeah, and approximate how the uh, stellar activity might then um, impact on a, on a planet that is um, at a certain distance from this host star. I mean, these are, yeah, there are many models out there, but we also know in the meantime, or or we will get uh, spectroscopic um, data from exoplanet atmospheres, and and with that um, you might gain even more insight about uh, what happens um, or how the the atmospheric evolution might have happened. I mean, with the exoplanet systems, we can look into very different uh, phases of a um, stellar planetary evolution of the system, right? So it's it's not um, in our Sun Earth system we only have. Um, our 4.5 uh, billion years, uh, and that's it. But in, in um, looking at various systems, we have very different stages of evolution and um, looking at the host star about its activity and maybe um, spectroscopic data about exoplanets. I think in the future, there might be information, additional information also to get um, um, more knowledge on that, yeah. Thank you. So, Vema, you have a question, please. Uh, hi, Manolo. It's an excellent. Okay. Uh, so I have a simple question uh, that so uh, when a uh, MC happens on the sun and uh, it travels to the, towards the earth, so in situ observations in some of the CMEs, we we can't sometimes in some of the cases at least uh, some smooth variation of the magnetic field, one of the component of the magnetic field. So how would we see them in terms of uh, flux flow for topological? Topology uh, scenario. How can you see them? Um, How can you understand? You mean the the, the flux rope, uh, the Sorry? variation uh, of the flux rope itself? Yeah, yeah. So I think. I mean, we have the the smooth rotate. We have the very turbulent uh, okay. sheath, right? Yeah. How can you understand them? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure because um, uh, your internet connection is a bit uh, disrupted. Um, so we have the very turbulent um, uh, shock. So after the shock, very turbulent uh, sheath region, right? And uh, in um, after that, usually uh, we mm -hmm. define the, the flux rope by the. It, it starts to smooth out, so it means we have a very, uh, very um, uh, low uh, variations in the field plus the rotation of the of the magnetic field. So usually when observing the vector components of the magnetic field and having the variations um, in different um, uh, directions, um, so plus to minus, then we usually can um, uh, derive the, the flux rope orientation and distinguish clearly between um, the shock sheath uh, structure and the, um, and the flux rope, if that was your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me uh, be some more clear. So, suppose, uh, suppose if we take some of the events happened in 2015 uh, uh, July, uh, June, something like that. So, in all of those Earth directed means, we can't see smooth variation of the magnetic field. So, we uh, even though the CME encounters the Earth, okay, but uh, we don't see the smooth variation such that we can interpret them in terms of uh, a flux rope. Okay, so that's, that's the question. How can we interpret them? What is happening to them? So, so yeah, that's the question. Okay, so anyway, so uh, I, another another simple question what I have in that in one of your slides you have fitted the uh, CM in the Lasco field of view or the stereo field of view at least uh, uh, in the GCF GCS model. Okay, so one. Is shock component and magnetic field component that is flux rope component. So how can we do that both differently? Shock and both. Uh, yeah. 
is in the right, so, uh, bottom um, panels. Asset so what are green and um, yellow? Uh, right. So uh, as said, it's it's um, uh, only having the the side view. It's usually um, yeah. In addition, having the ha so in addition to the halo view, having the side view, it's uh, it's um, you can best uh, distinguish between a driver and, and the shock. Uh, intriguing um, signatures would be these uh, kind of bent uh, streamers that pop up here. I mean, you also need to see the, the movies or the animation of the different steps as the CME evolve. But very intriguing is this um, is this bent uh, streamer here that is usually um, related to the to the shock component, and um, and we also see that um, that usually these um, these more um, these more uh, kind of uh, yes. Uh, Distinguished um, or, or these uh, more strong outlines here are referring to the to the flux rope component, while this more blurry stuff out here is um, is related to the shock. But as I said, you need to also to okay, have a look at the animation of the different steps. Then it's more clear to distinguish between the uh, the driver and, and the shock component. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm a small uh, if you allow me. Uh, so in this kind of GCS models, if the uh, we have the three pod structure, right? So if it is very near to the sun, okay. So the GCS flux rope is fitted to where? Is it see a core part? Is is it the entire um, leading edge also? So in, I uh, need so to ask that whether the three pod three pod structure still does exist in the present scenario of understanding. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, the three part structure is, is still valid. So that's, um, I mean, uh, the GCS here is fitted first with, um, uh, with a spherical type of, uh, um, so the parameters are set such that, uh, that it's not a flux rope anymore. It's more like a, a sphere um, that relates to the shock component because we, we know latest by the, by the, uh, by the studies by, by Quan that you can see here that the shock component is this uh, kind of spherical type. And uh, in addition, um, so the, the flux rope component, as you see here, is, is more this um, uh, oval um, cross section um, as it's um, the usual understanding of a, of a flux rope. It's, um, and also looking at it in the three dimensions, you see that the green part, the shock part is, um, is staying a spherical, has a spherical cross section because it's a, a sphere. And uh, the flux rope has its uh, the usual flux rope type thing with an oval cross section when looking um, from the from the front. So the um, shock sheath uh, flux rope part is definitely um, valid. I mean the uh, the the core part that is usually uh, the prominence um, is I mean many times not well seen in chronographs. Um, so. Um, that's usually, I mean, not a hard criteria, I would say, but uh, shock sheath and flux rope is definitely the area. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so let me see if we have any other questions. Yeah, please raise hand, raise hands. So, so Manuela, I have one question and want to know your comments on this. So in Heliospheric imager on stereo, we could not actually image the cavity part, which is very important for space weather prediction. So, are we like confident that that can be tracked in imagers of like next generation and Parker Solar Probe and Solar Arbiter? Yeah, the magnetic field part is, uh, is definitely that's one of the big outstanding uh, questions and, and issues. I mean, um, yeah, in, in white light data, I mean, there is um, basically no chance. The thing is, we need to uh, maybe use uh, extrapolations or, or uh, fields, um, magnetic field simulations from the erupting flux rope to be able to, to get the, um, the orientation of the field right hand. Um, it's also when Parker solar probe is uh, kind of in the sun earth line and uh, measures the fields uh, close to the sun, then we can assume that it, um, I mean, the coherency is, is given if we are not too, um, uh, so if if we are in, in the same line of sight. Um, so if Parker or, or Orbiter measures the fields uh, early on uh, close to the sun, then we can be sure. And if we are in the same line of sight, um, then the, that the magnetic field component is also the one that reaches us. 
with the um, extrapolations, it's um, yeah the same thing. We have a lot of uncertainties. We have rotation of the of the CME that we might. Um, I mean, white lights data uh, could give us more information about rotation and to use that combined information. But um, just taking remote sensing data, magnetic field information is not given now. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, Argadeep, you have a question, please. Yes, uh, Manuela, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering that in one of the slides you showed uh, that your group is also working with uh, magneto sheet jets. Uh, could mm -hmm. you please elaborate a little more on that? Right, so um, the jets are basically, um, they are um, kind of a coupling effect, as already said. They are a pressure enhancement in the, um, so if you have observations by, for example, Themis, um, as Simi, uh, Themis is, is crossing here, uh, so in between uh, within magnetopause and then going into the solar wind, it crosses the magneto sheath, and then you see some very uh, distinct uh, pressure enhancements. And these pressure enhancements are kind of um, uh, interpreted as as um, as jets. Um, I think they also had um, had uh, many different uh, names. Um, um, pressure or pulses, um, and not a magnetosphere, but large scale. Uh, these these structures are clearly seen in the um, in these um, in these uh, measurements here. As as I said, pressure enhancement, and these pressure enhancements they obviously propagate uh, from um, the magneto sheath uh, towards the magneto pulse. So they have a, a certain direction. Um, they are related to um, to the uh, quasi parallel um, or parallel uh, magnetic uh, uh, component here. So in this um, in the region where the, the parallel um, 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 so the bow shock is, is parallel, and uh, and with that um, in this region there are kind of um, yeah the best conditions so that these uh, these jets occur. What we have done, um, or what Florian did in his studies, um, to see whether CIRs and CMEs, how they relate to these jets. And actually, it was seen as uh, when a um, SIR, so if there is compressed plasma that comes into the, um, into the or uh, that um, uh, sweeps over Earth, uh, the jet uh, occurrence increased. But if um, a CME sweeped over Earth, um, especially the, the flux rope components, so the smooth magnetic field, the jet number decreased. Um, all that we could relate to the um, orientation of the so the, the clock angle, magnetic field uh, of the magnetic field, and um, and with that uh, um, and Alfenig Mach numbers. Uh, so the um, how strongly or how past the large scale disturbances incoming and um, how the orientation of the uh, global magnetic field is um, is definitely is definitely related to the jet occurrence rate but um, from the the jets are really a pressure enhancement that is propagating or that is kind of um, forwarded to the magnetopause and um, as this little cartoon illustrates might even cause then a reaction on the magnetopause and then cascade downwards uh, to to earth Maybe surface or so. Okay, thank you so much. So I think we are exceeding with time, so we will stop here. And thanks, Manola, for uh, taking time out of your schedule to be here. And uh, Sridhar, you can please take further. Thank you all. We'll, we'll end the meeting now. Thank you, Manola. Yeah. Okay. Thank it's you. A lot for thank the you, everyone. Invitation.